As Wide Shut is probably the most widely discussed movie in conspiracy theory circles due to its scenes of lead character Bill Harford accidentally infiltrating a secret society of masked wealthy men, engaging in an orgy with prostitutes, all conducted in a ritualistic manner. On first viewing of the film, it's totally unexpected, being that everything that occurs beforehand seems to be a relationship drama. Even the most straight-laced viewer has to ask themselves, what the hell is Kubrick showing us? Is this a real cult he's exposing, or has he made it all up? Many have been trying to answer that question since the film was made, but mostly the research into the subject is being conducted by people who already believe the world is covertly run by some particular secret society with evil intentions, so confirmation bias inevitably sets in. For example, I've read many online forum claims that Stanley Kubrick was a 33rd degree Freemason, but I have never come across a shred of evidence to support the idea. Kubrick's strong, independent streak ensured that he didn't even fit in at school or college and avoided university, so strict commitment to the rules of a secret society would be completely out of character for him. Being that I've produced video studies of Eyes Wide Shut and other Kubrick movies in the past, I've had the odd email from people pushing the 33rd degree Mason claim, and when I've asked these people for evidence, the answer has virtually always been the same. That's the only way he could know the things he knew. As in the orgy scenes shown in Eyes Wide Shut and the state-sponsored mind control scenes in A Clockwork Orange, etc. The major flaw of their argument is that it isn't proven that what we see in Eyes Wide Shut's orgy is an accurate portrayal of any real secret society, nor are there any real-world equivalents of governments successfully creating the mind control techniques presented in A Clockwork Orange. There have been documented attempts at total mind control, but not documented success. Similar claims are made about Dr. Strangelove's detailed depiction of nuclear war strategy, Kubrick having inside information and therefore being an insider. But, as I found when researching that film's production, virtually all of the information Kubrick was privy to was publicly accessible to anyone who took the time to find and read it all at the time. It's amazing how much stuff gets published and admitted to in the face of all the supposed secret stuff. So my aim in this video is to explore, in a rational and unbiased manner, neither tinfoil hat nor head in the sand debunker, the many possible interpretations of Eyes Wide Shut's secret society scenes. Is the whole thing a black mass? A high degree of masonry? Is it the Hellfire Club? There are lots of possibilities, and I intend to explore the merits of each popular interpretation, plus some noteworthy interpretations that haven't been doing the rounds very much, and in some cases haven't been doing the rounds at all. But before we start going through a case-by-case -case comparison, I first want to offer some general thoughts about secret society cults and their role in civilization. Now I'm going to take a little bit of time with this, so bear with me, it's probably going to be at least 10 minutes worth of this opening section of the video. The very nature of secret societies lends itself both to confirmation bias and its opposing psychological process, denial. Hence, there have been no mainstream media reviews of Eyes Wide Shut that I've come across, which actually raised the question of whether Kubrick had tried to expose a real high society cult with his final film. Social attitudes to secret societies are similar to religious beliefs, in a way. Believers claim God can only be discovered through faith, and so the lack of evidence is a test of that faith. Non-believers have no conclusive explanations about the nature of the universe or the nature of human consciousness, yet they still claim that physical science has all the answers. Fortunately though, the question of secret societies is a bit easier to unravel than religious beliefs, as there is actually evidence to prove and disprove many of the claims. For example, nearly every major city has a Masonic Lodge at a designated address, and many lodges run their own websites. So yes, Freemasonry is a real organisation or collection of organisations. The Illuminati? Not so easy. The Bilderbergers? Just a rumour. That is, until it got major press coverage and set up a website of its own. Plus, even the most resistant debunker would have to concede that the Ku Klux Klan, at the very least, has existed in the past and may still exist. Nobody tries to debunk the existence of the Mafia or the Triads, each of which can equally be called cults or secret societies, as in their activities and membership are not publicly disclosed. And nobody denies that during times of war or under particular oppressive regimes, people of particular religious faiths often have to take their beliefs underground and effectively become secret societies just to avoid persecution. 
Quite simply, it is the case that secret societies do exist in many different forms. Some are criminal, some aren't, and some of them have their own unique religious belief systems that are pretty much alien to outsiders. History is full of examples of secret societies, and thousands are operating today from street gangs to drug smuggling cartels to rich gentlemen's clubs to covert think tanks, etc. But one of the major perceptual flaws that constitute what is usually referred to as conspiracy theory thinking is the idea that one particular secret society has become so powerful that it has become all-dominating. It's true that secret societies comprising people in influential positions can have specific influences, but the idea that the entire direction of society is pre-planned on all fronts by one group, or a very small number of groups, is asking too much. Bankers may, in their private affiliations with each other, conspire to ruin an economy or affect the price of gold, but those bankers won't have the iron grip control of fashion trends, music culture, religion culture, sexual culture, technological innovation, or the thousands of other factors that comprise our civilization. Even if they try, they cannot control all those things. They can wield huge influence in many areas through the withdrawal or allocating of funds, but the world is too complex for them to track, never mind control, everything. I mean, the complexity is absolutely overwhelming. Impossible for anybody to truly comprehend. Likewise, the pathological denier of conspiracy theories is foolish to assume that private membership organisations have no major effects on the structure of civilization. One need only look at the effects of religious belief systems throughout history, and upon architecture across the globe to verify influence in realms where the religious presence doesn't rightly belong. I'm not just talking about Freemasonic architecture, after all they came from the building professions, but the influence of Catholic, Muslim, Hinduism and other religions upon architecture. We see this all over the world. The truth lies in between. Secret societies do influence civilization in various ways, but their influence is scattered, divided, and often in conflict with one another, and in conflict with general trends that spontaneously occur as driven by the spontaneous hive mind of the general public. That latter influence is huge, but easy to forget because it's mostly uncoordinated and undocumented, and is incredibly complex. And most secret society cults are struggling entities wanting to expand, but unable to attract enough members or money. Another problem I've encountered with secret society research is that those seeking to prove both the existence and criminal intent of such societies often perceive information exposures about secret societies to be somehow deceptive. A funny one is the belief that occultists have an obligation to indirectly reveal to the world what they're doing, so that their fellow initiates can recognise the influence while the ignorance remain blindfolded. Now that notion isn't entirely without merit. Sometimes certain types of codes can be used publicly to communicate with others, but it's not necessarily a thing that they have to do it. Secret hand symbols, passwords, coded clothing, tattoos and the likes are used by many organised street gangs, they're also used among masons. But at the same time, such gangs and organisations often accidentally expose themselves or are exposed by others. But the classic conspiracy theorist mistake I'm finding very often today is that people perceive the embarrassing exposure as a planned revelation. The term predictive programming gets overused to mistake uncontrolled exposure for controlled communication by the secret society itself. This is a very complex area because deliberately false leaks of information can and are used in many facets of life. For example, in warfare, an army may deliberately leak information so as to mislead their enemy into a self-defeating course of action. In fact, there are one or two examples of secret society conduct that appear to fit the model of, what could we call it, public opinion management. We'll have more on that later though. Another problem with perception of secret societies is the notion that such societies think and behave in ways that are so alien so as to be beyond the comprehension of average people. Yes, a little bit, but generally this is not the case. Those societies are comprised of flesh and blood humans, unless you believe in the reptilian ideas, which is just totally stupid. And so the pathological patterns within those societies are reflected elsewhere in everyday society. We may think of secret society rituals as some insane aberration, yet one only need attend a Sunday mass at our local church to witness complex and intricate rituals 
which if you study it really don't make any sense. We have all manner of social rituals such as Valentine's Day, Easter, Christmas and Halloween. Most of us don't even believe in the religious aspects behind those kinds of holidays, yet we still conform to the rituals. Is dressing up as monsters, witches and the living dead en masse every year at Halloween any less crazy than the average religious ceremony? We have weddings, funerals, birthdays. Our lives are full of ritual, even down to the clothes we wear and how we conduct ourselves in general interactions. Shaking hands, saying thank you, hello, goodbye, tipping a cab driver, all micro-rituals. It all just might seem like natural behaviour to us, but jump to another part of the world or to a different century, and we would find that all these micro-rituals were very different. With regards to Eyes Wide Shut's orgy sequence, we have music festivals where people consume lots of alcohol, take drugs, dance, and there are plenty of swingers clubs about where people trade sexual partners and have sex in front of each other. We're just not used to seeing such things happen in the strict manner that is presented in Eyes Wide Shut or in the setting of the very rich. So even if the orgy ritual of the film is a genuine depiction of some real secret society of the wealthy, it's not actually that big a deal. Another reason there's so much confusion about secret societies is brought up on page 156 to 157 of Francis King's book about the ritual degrees of the Ordo Templi Orientis, also known as the OTO. As part one of the late degree rituals, it is outlined to initiates that malicious rumours are often spread by one religion against another to cause discredit and to justify persecution. Religious groups accuse each other of holding secret orgies at the higher ranks, of committing child sacrifices, and even of roasting and dividing babies to be used in talismans among initiates. And funnily enough, classic conspiracy theorists make those kinds of claims as well, and usually without basis. In other words, religions demonise each other. At the same time, the OTO text demonstrates their own point by alleging that in Roman churches, secret black masses are held by officials who privately reject their own religious teachings. This paranoia and demonization among competitors is abundant even in the very public sphere between major religious institutions. So it's plausible that rumours of ritual child sacrifice and the likes, which are often claimed about some secret societies, could be manifestations of this phenomena. And unfortunately, even in today's world, some religious groups engage in much more psychopathic behaviour than what we see in Eyes Wide Shut. Did you ever watch the video of a 12-year-old boy beheaded by jihadists in Syria? Have you seen the videos of jihadists engaging in ritual slaughter of captives? I've seen ones involving people hung upside down and their throats cut like cattle. No special effects as far as I could tell. Continuous camera shots and so no deceptive editing and crystal clear footage in HD. It's horrific stuff and those actions are conducted by ISIS and its offshoots and competitors. Ritual sacrifice is going on now, in our time, and conducted by secretive organised groups in the Middle East. But is it limited to the Middle East? Regardless of all this, I find that most subscribers of religious belief systems, from orthodox Christian to underground occult, are generally of more or less the same mindset. They're driven by the same pathological urges, desire for safety and belonging to a high-numbered, internally committed social group, the desire for immortality beyond death, and the desire to have supernatural forces come to their aid in daily life. People who find dissatisfaction in one religious system will often swap to another one, like putting on a different costume. I've seen Masonic symbols embedded in the personal chairs of rank-and-file Catholic church members. The Masons tend to claim that their God is the same as everyone else's, and so a Muslim, Hindu or Christian can join their ranks while retaining dual membership of their original faith. But that's just a clever form of indoctrination as far as I can tell, a clever means of luring people away from other religions. All of the pathological patterns I've outlined among major religions are reflected in secret society religions too, many examples of which will be given throughout this study. Religious institutions have even stole each other's symbols and allegorical stories over the centuries, while often accusing each other of worshipping false gods and even of being superstitious. They're all superstitious, of course. And then we have the splintering of big religions into factions who then go to war with each other over the details of their rituals and beliefs. The cross-fertilisation of religious symbols is very important for our study here because if one is predisposed to interpreting one specific secret society as being represented in the film, then we can easily forget the use of that secret society's symbols in other contexts. 
As a classic example, take the pyramid and all-seeing eye. To some, this image absolutely means the Illuminati, but it's also used in Freemasonry and has popped up in Christian imagery as well, the Holy Trinity. It's also on the dollar bill. Obelisks are another one used in Freemasonry, but have popped up elsewhere. The Christians started placing a cross on top of them as a sort of incorporation into their religion. The swastika has been used in several religions prior to the Nazi version, and newly formed secret societies tend to adopt popular symbols already in use to try and quickly establish their own credibility, and to imply themselves to have an extensive historical lineage. The Nazis set themselves up as being the continuation of historical ideals, hence the Third Reich. Many groups try to link themselves back to secret Egyptian knowledge and so on. It's essential to keep the cross-fertilization of symbols in mind so that we don't fall into a confirmation bias trap regarding any one particular secret society. Before we get into a case-by-case -case comparison of the scenes, beginning with Freemasonry, first let me offer some general observations of the sequence without attributing any specific secret society meaning. Oh, and I have to say as well that, one or two examples aside, I'm not going to talk much about the specific masks of the participants, as I intend to devote a separate video to that issue, being that it veers off into unrelated areas. So, here's some basic observations about Eyes Wide Shut's cult scenes that I consider noteworthy. All of the participants who engage in the intimidation and unmasking of Bill Harford appear to be men. The women, who were naked, have disappeared from the gathering. However, it's possible that there are still some women in these robes. I say that for two reasons. First, the two who are stood on the balcony and acknowledge Bill's entry of the room, one of them has a female mask on and appears to be the partner of the one in the male-looking mask. And second, when Nick the piano player is led out of the estate, we see that some of the women dancing are clothed. Though these women are commanded by Red Cloak, they appear to personally choose their sexual partners among those around them, so it seems to be luck of the draw as to who gets laid and who doesn't. The rest have to be content with watching, unless they get sloppy follow-ups later. Next up, there seems to be no ethnic diversity among the participants. Contrast this, however, with the Japanese or Chinese guys who Millich catches with his daughter. Despite the lack of ethnic diversity, the crowd are international. Red Cloak has an English accent, and the servant, who we hear, has an American accent. There was also a Hungarian guy at Ziegler's party who seems the kind of guy who'd fit right in there at the Summerton Orgy. So how many other nationalities are present? Whatever they are, they mostly seem to be Western ones. Next up, it's important to note that the novel Trom Novelle, upon which the movie is based, doesn't offer a detailed description of the orgy and ritual. It's incredibly vague, so Kubrick had to come up with the details himself. The novel does, however, mention masks and cloaks, and people getting naked from the neck down. The novel also has an emphasis on the lead character being Jewish. Kubrick and his hired co-writer Frederick Raphael debated this stuff. Both of them were Jewish, but they butted heads on the issue according to Raphael's memoirs. Raphael, who seems to be preoccupied with his Jewish identity, wanted to retain and enhance this aspect of the story, but Kubrick wanted it removed. Being that he was in charge of the project, Kubrick did it his way and gave the lead character a non-Jewish name, Bill Harford. However, in the Stanley Kubrick archives book, it's noted that at one point, many years before production, Kubrick was considering Woody Allen in the lead role, and with an emphasis on the character having a Jewish identity. Seems he changed his mind. In the novel, the lead character is brave in the face of being exposed as an infiltrator. He refuses to remove his mask and demands to be punished himself rather than let a woman take his place, but his request is refused. The couriers are dressed in yellow and blue, not purple or black, and there is no character in charge of the whole secret group. No red cloak character. In the novel, the wife character's dream much more closely matches the orgy, but then it progresses into different territory. In her dream, Bill is asked to be the woman's lover and refuses because he is destined to be faithful to his wife forever. He is given the death sentence by his captors and is tortured with whips and then crucified while his wife watches and laughs as she embraces another man. So that's a lot more dark than the description given by Alice in the movie. Despite these major differences, most of the dialogue in the ritual and orgy scenes of the movie is lifted straight from the novel. I believe this indicates that the dialogue isn't particularly important in terms of what Kubrick personally wanted to communicate. The visuals and music are where his creative input are to be found. 
Kubrick thought a lot about this. Frederick Raphael outlines that he was asked by Kubrick to conduct research into orgies by the Romans and other historical groups. And in a book which is published as part of the Stanley Kubrick Masterpiece Collection, there's a crudely drawn storyboard of an alternate version of the ritual. It's almost certainly drawn by Kubrick himself. I've seen his sketches at the archives and they look very similar. In this version, men and women form a double circle with each circle spinning in an opposing direction to the other, women on the inside, men on the outside, and holding hands in each circle. The men bow to the women, someone hits a gong, and they pair off in couples. Then the process starts all over again. So why is the version in the film so different? Well, this is a guess on my part, but I think it makes sense. The double circle would have been too crowded a scenario to film. The version in the movie lets us see more clearly what's going on, there also doesn't seem to be a Red Cloak leader character in the early storyboard, and remember there was no equivalent character in the novel, so maybe the presence of Red Cloak was the main reason why this was all changed. Regarding Red Cloak, I'll quickly recite my interpretation that he is in fact Victor Ziegler, or at the least he represents Victor Ziegler. I outline this in detail in my video Red Cloak Unmasked, which is on YouTube. The comparison of the Red Pool table and Red Carpet the pointing threats from both characters, and Ziegler's circular movements and double tapping of the pool ball and chalk, which mirrors Red Cloak's twirling of an incense ball and double tapping of his staff. There's plenty more evidence of mutual identity, so go check out my Red Cloak Unmasked video if you haven't seen it. A last important issue before we move on. Frederick Raphael's memoirs of co-writing Guys Wide Shut with Kubrick are full of personal disdain and immature character attacks, not just on Kubrick but on other directors, and he makes it worse by constantly trying to big himself up intellectually. He also released his book shortly after Kubrick's death, which seems like a cowardly thing to do being that his opponent wasn't around to counter the claims made in the book. Kubrick's relatives publicly expressed their disgust with Raphael, and personally I was so put off by his attitude that I vowed never to bother reading any of his novels. He strikes me as a self-absorbed and vindictive man. Nevertheless, Raphael's memoirs are worthy of exploration. A lot of the things he describes tally up very well with other accounts by Kubrick collaborators. Particularly, and this seems to be what pissed Raphael off severely, Kubrick steadfastly refused to reveal why he wanted to make the film, and he would have Raphael do endless drafts without specifying what he wanted. Raphael would do the drafts, and almost everything he came up with would be rejected. This happened as well with the scripting of the movie AI Artificial Intelligence. Multiple writers were involved, and sci-fi writer Ian Watson gave a long, unflattering account of his involvement, published in Playboy magazine, an extended version of which is currently posted on the Kubrick site. Both writers were utterly frustrated with Kubrick's secretiveness, yet they were hired to do a job, and as far as I know they were paid and Kubrick was under no obligation to confide his personal motives in making those movies. He basically used writers to add surface plotting to his movies while keeping the important hidden subtext to himself. The writers may not have liked it, but they got paid as agreed. But what I consider very important is Raphael's claims that he supplied Kubrick with a fake FBI document concerning a sex cult secret society in America. He had the idea that there ought to be some backstory about the orgies which took place in, uh, in um, Eyes Wide Shut. So I wrote a document, um, a sort of CIA report about certain people who were admirers of Jack Kennedy and who formed a sort of Kennedy club, which kind of relived the sexual exploits of Kennedy and all the rest of it. And this was a sort of FBI report on these people and uh, their doings and what they got up to all the rest of it. And I, I must have faxed it, because in those days you had to fax everything. I faxed it through to Stanley. And the phone rang uh, quite quickly. And he said, Freddie? Can you talk? <laughs> he always said, can you talk, as if I was having an affair with him, you know, and was my wife in the room. Yeah, I, I, I can talk. Okay, so listen, uh, where, where'd you get this stuff? So I said, what? Said, oh, no, 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 I, I'm serious here. Where'd you get this FBI report from? So I said, well, you, you asked me to write something about the background, and, and uh, you know, that's it. You know, where'd you get it? So I said, Stanley, I, 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 how do you think I managed to do it within the hour? I wrote it, didn't I? 
No, because no, I really have to know. I mean, I mean, if you've got access to some kind of secret material, I have to know. I mean, you have to level with me. The secret material is between my ears. There isn't any secret material. You wrote that in one hour? Well, I just typed it out. Okay. There's an old American expression about people not knowing shit from Shinola. And the truth is, directors have no idea, though they have great fears about the capacity of writers to generate stuff. And now, we only have Raphael's word to go on regarding this. It could just be a malicious effort to discredit Kubrick. But let's assume he's telling us the truth. What does his story tell us? Well, aside from the question of why Raphael would want to deceive Kubrick in the first place, there's the question of whether Kubrick really did believe the document was real. He may have suspected Raphael faked it, but wanted to make sure so that his film didn't bring him into conflict with a criminal group of that nature. Understandable. But there are two things I consider more important. First, that Kubrick was apparently ready to believe the story. Why would he believe such a thing? And second, how much of Raphael's fake FBI report was mentally cobbled together from things he actually knew about the real world. A writer always draws on their experience of real life to flesh out a story. I'm not saying Raphael knew of or was a member of some real secret society that is the same as what he wrote, though that's certainly possible. What I mean is that if he was trying to make a convincing story, then he must have drew on real life. Hence, he described the group as being inspired by the Kennedy family. The more detailed outline of the fake report is described in Raphael's memoirs. He specifies that the society called themselves The Free, which cracked me up considering the parallel with Freemasons. He says that the society is staunchly against the Democrat Party, which is ironic being that they admired Kennedy, who was a Democrat. Maybe Raphael was a Democrat supporter himself. He describes that the group admired Kennedy's ability to conform to morality in public, yet to be hedonistic and immoral in private. It seems Raphael didn't like Kennedy, and the group have a motto, enough is never enough, which is kind of corny. He says the group are sexual excess seekers and that the fear of public exposure enhances their enjoyment of orgies. Journalists aren't allowed near the group at all, but relationships with media owners are cultivated to ensure press releaks are blocked in advance. He says the group embraces women's liberation and allows female members, but doesn't allow prostitutes because their discretion can't be assured. That's in conflict with the movie in which Siegler says Mandy was a prostitute and was apparently the woman at the orgy. The group only recruit among their rich friends and have a rule never to talk about their activities among the general population who they consider slaves. They have a security group called The Plumbers, bit of an intercourse joke there maybe, and they sometimes test their security efficiency by deliberately allowing a non-member to infiltrate. They have masked meetings and no links with any other secret societies, and they value four types of freedom. Freedom from democracy, correctness, publicity, and from love. Right, so how crazy does all that sound to you? Do you think such a society could exist? Well, the funny thing is that some of these traits overlap with historically documented secret societies and cults, some of which we will explore in the rest of this video. Raphael may have believed what he thought of was pure fiction, but I think what he's done is tap into some of his own darker subconscious edges, edges the rest of us have as well. And he's thus ended up writing something that others have already thought up and acted upon for the most part. Kubrick most likely recognised the parallels with real secret societies. In fact, I'm certain of it because among his research items for Eyes Wide Shut and the Kubrick archives is a box of books, mostly about the author of Trom Novell, but included with them is a copy of Francis King's 1980 book, Cult and Occult. Undoubtedly, Kubrick had read through it, and so he would have come across that book's descriptions of occultist secret societies, descriptions which have surprising overlaps with both Raphael's fake FBI report and the orgy ritual scenes that Kubrick eventually filmed for Eyes Wide Shut.